Welcome to the uh, Jones series. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, today's speaker, David Vernon. Uh, David got an undergraduate degree in material science and engineering from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and that's actually his hometown. He's, he's from Madison. Uh, <coughs> then uh, worked with uh, a startup company in the fuel cell area for almost two years, Polyfuel, and also had stints at Los Alamos National Lab and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, all pursuing energy. And then you'll hear today about David's uh, doctoral work in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And as you'll see, there's a fair element of chemical engineering uh, in his work. So in a way very much aligned with our uh, not particularly compartmentalized approach. Uh, David's, uh, I think, uh, energy work is, is quite consistent with that. So without further ado, David, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Lee, and thank you for your recognition here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about my work in thermochemical recuperation for hydrogen enriched combustion. Before we dive right into some of the more technical concepts, just start out with an outline and a little bit of an overview. Um, I'll talk a little bit about energy systems, energy and exergy efficiency, get into hydrogen enrichment of internal combustion engines and why anyone would be interested in doing that. Um, get on into where the hydrogen for hydrogen enrichment could come from, um, chances to utilize waste heat resources in these processes, um, and then the details of a way of doing this that we've called uh, thermochemical recuperation. And finally, talk about the overall systems benefits for integrating this thermochemical recuperation system with an internal combustion engine. And I'm going to go a little bit quickly, so feel free to ask questions and I'll try to answer them quickly as I go along. So in our efforts to, to create more sustainable energy systems, there's a number of different things that we can do. We can try to increase energy efficiency by extracting as much service as possible for a given resource input. We can try to increase exergy efficiency by fully utilizing the capacity of the resources that we're going to use to do useful work, not squandering them by mismatching the energy resource to the process we're trying to do. And then finally, utilize waste from subsequent processes to extract multiple services as energy goes from its high quality input to the low quality waste heat in the final. Sorry to do this already. Mm -hmm. Can you define exergy? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much for that question. <laughs> so, the, the, the easiest conceptual definition of exergy that we'll stick with for now. I'd be happy to discuss more rigorous technical definitions with you afterwards if you'd like, but is the maximum amount of useful work that can be extracted from a system as it comes into equilibrium with the environment. This, this equilibrium's chemical energy equilibrium, this equilibrium's thermal energy equilibrium, electrical energy equilibrium, and exergy is really a, a measure of the best that we can do. What's the best that we could do with the perfect processes, with reversible processes? So then, to take a look at the, the overall energy picture in the United States, this chart's from 2002, just because I like the way it looked better. Um, there's small changes um, as the economy has, has um, slimmed down just a little bit over the last couple of years. The total exergy flows changed a little bit, and the overall efficiency seems to have actually improved slightly. Um, but the main takeaways I want you to get from here is not all the numbers, but just the general idea that we start over here on this side with primary energy resources that are high availability, high exergy resources, um, predominantly chemical energy resources. A few you know, others, but predominantly chemical energy resources that are then converted to supply services and generate um, useful energy and work and also output large quantities of waste heat. And 
the waste heat that comes out is at significantly lower quality, lower exergy than the inputs, but may still have sufficient quality to be useful for subsequent processes. And each of these boxes here are energy convergence systems, predominantly combustion systems. That if you, if you look at the overall trend, the overall energy conversion processes, combustion dominates it, and in internal combustion engines play a very significant role in transportation, vehicles, trains, boats, in industry, and in the electric power sector. So I'm going to talk significantly more about internal combustions today that can be applied both to vehicles and to stationary uses, and also in transportation. So when we talk about trying to improve the efficiency of an energy conversion device, such as in internal combustion engines, there's, there's a number of things that you can do. And one exciting way of increasing the efficiency and reducing emissions in internal combustion engines is by adding a small amount of hydrogen to the air and fuel mixture that you're already going to burn. There's also a, a kind of extension of this to run the engine completely on hydrogen or completely on a hydrogen rich gas. Um, the gamut between those two is something we'll talk about more. Um, the way that hydrogen enrichment works is that it increases the flame speed and generates free radicals more early in the combustion process so that the fuel has more time to burn completely. It increases flame speed so that the flame can traverse the cylinder more quickly and raise the pressure in the cylinder earlier in the expansion stroke so that the average pressure during the expansion is higher. More work can be extracted per unit of energy put in. Um, it also stabilizes the flames so that they can tolerate much larger amounts of exhaust gas recirculation or much leaner operation by mixing in excess air. Some of the reasons why this happened is that hydrogen has very unique combustion processes. Very high flame speeds, low lean limit, very high molecular diffusion coefficient, and a high octane number. Adding a hydrogen-rich gas to, or substituting, in this case, gasoline with a hydrogen-rich gas in a spark ignition internal combustion engine um, has the potential to simultaneously increase efficiency significantly while decreasing engine out NOx emissions. And this is somewhat unusual. Many different ways of increasing efficiency increase the NOx emissions and many ways of reducing NOx emissions decrease efficiency. So this is, is a very exciting trend to see. And I'd be happy to discuss this, this more at the, the end of the talk because there's some rich information here. So this begs the question, well, okay, that's great. You can add hydrogen to an engine, but where's the hydrogen going to come from? Um, you have to get it from somewhere. And it could come from a centralized production facility, but then you need to transport it, you need to distribute it to vehicles, you need to store it on, door, on board the vehicles. And the infrastructure is not available now and is likely not to be widely available for in the near term. So one other option is to generate that vehicle at the engine site for a stationary engine or on board the vehicle, whether it be a train, a ship, or a car. Um, and one way of doing this on the vehicle is to use a reformation process that splits the, f of the fuel molecule into a syngas, into hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And you can potentially add water so that you get hydrogen, more hydrogen and carbon dioxide out of the process. And this is called reformation. If you reform the primary fuel, then it can be significantly more transparent to the user. The user doesn't have to go and fill up with a secondary fuel in order to use this process. So then maybe the next logical question is, well, how efficiently can you do this? Can you do this efficiently on board a vehicle or on site near an, a generator or engine use? Um, and one approach to this is what we call thermochemical recuperation, which is utilizing waste heat to provide some of the energy for this endothermic reformation process. 
in, in a gasoline um, SI internal combustion engine, you get a pretty wide range of temperatures over the operating map for the engine. Um, in this work, you can see that the temperatures run from um, just below 600 degrees C up to above 100, 850 degrees C. So we have pretty significant exergy left in this waste heat. It's a pretty high quality source of heat and with internal combustion engines so prominent as energy conversion devices, we have really a large source of useful energy that's currently being completely wasted. This, this heat um, comes from the lower heating value of the fuel and from the exhaust gases we see is in the range of 34 to 45 percent depending on the engine operating speed and torque and to the coolant between 17 and 26 percent. So we've got coolant, a source of, of low temperature heat, um, typically around 100 degrees C, and exhaust gases, a source of higher temperature heat. So other than increasing the energy efficiency of a process we also want to increase the, the exergy efficiency of a process by utilizing the full potential of our energy resources to do work. This requires matching the, the fuel or the energy resource that we're going to use to the appropriate end use, not using high quality fuels to perform low quality services. An example of this is electric space, space heating. One of the one of the worst matches of high exergy electrical energy to very low exergy heating that we're using this electricity which has the potential to do almost the, the, the same amount of work as the energy in the electricity, a 100% availability, a high exergy energy resource and we're turning it into room temperature heat where that room temperature heat has almost zero capability to do work as that heat equilibrates with the atmosphere. So we destroy virtually all of the exergy in that energy resource and we generate the, almost the maximum amount of entropy possible in the process. A, a better match between this high exergy um, high availability electricity is a heat pump. If you use an electric motor to drive a compressor um, in a heat pump, you can, in a reversible system, moving heat from 0 degrees C outside to 20 degrees C inside, move 14.7 times as much heat energy. So if you have one kilowatt of electricity, you can get 14.7 times that amount of heat into your house. Um, uh, the real systems have some irreversibility, so they don't achieve this perfect reversible system coefficient of performance, but they receive, can achieve 2.5 to 5 times the amount of heat energy to come into your house. So even though that electric heater had a near 100% energy efficiency, we can see that there's much better options. Just optimizing for energy efficiency leaves many resources underutilized and allows you to use primary resources in ways that squander the majority of their capacity to do useful work. So in any of these systems where you have a process that has a, a lower exergy demand than the resource that you're using to provide it, you have the, the potential to put in a system upstream to extract some work out of this energy. Energy is conserved, so as long as the quality remains high enough to then meet that next process's needs, you can extract more work from this energy resource with no potentially no degradation in, in the process that you were going to do anyway. So not only can you utilize waste heat after a process, but there are many opportunities to more fully utilize the exergy of energy resources upstream of the conversion processes that we typically use. So in combustion systems, there are some kind of simple conceptual ways to, to imagine this limitation. That the maximum, the typical fuels that we use for combustion have very high exergy. It's not quite as high as electricity, but 
virtually all of the energy in these high quality fuels is available to do work. But many combustion systems have limited maximum temperatures that, and these limited maximum temperatures are below the adiabatic temperature rise or near adiabatic achievable temp temperature rise for the fuels. That means that there's excess exergy that's being wasted that could potentially be utilized upstream of these combustion processes, and there's also waste heat downstream of these combustion processes. Thermochemical recuperation is a very conceptually interesting process that allows us to take advantage of both sources of energy that, analogous to the heat pump, this excess exergy that's available in the fuel that's not, that's impossible to use due to materials limitations to the maximum temperature limitations in the combustion process is available to, to do some work. And by doing the thermochemical recuperation process, we can use this excess exergy to convert a small portion of waste heat into higher exergy energy in the form of increased chemical potential energy through the process. This is theoretically possible, but in my work I, I wanted to explore and see if this could really happen in the laboratory in measured experiments. I chose ethanol as the fuel of interest, um, partially as Professor Lin can tell you, because there are some very interesting opportunities for ethanol to be renewably produced and dom domestically produced in many areas. And to the delight of many college students, it has a low human toxicity and a low environmental toxicity. <laughs> so another fortunate aspect of ethanol is that it has a relatively low temperature at which the molecule can be broken apart and turned into a hydrogen rich gas through the reformation process. So here's the simplest system schematic that you can imagine, where you take a portion of the fuel that you were going to burn in the engine anyway, and this portion can run from a small fraction up to the majority, or potentially even all of the fuel, and you reform it using waste heat from the exhaust gases. And the thermochemical recuperation process has been my area of study, my focus for the last couple of years here. So when you want to do this, you can choose several different potential processes to perform the reformation step. And three of the well-known processes are steam reformation, um, where all of the heat comes from an external source and is transferred into the reactor. Partial oxidation, where all of the heat to convert the fuel into a hydrogen-rich gas comes from combustion so that you add some air to combust a fraction of the fuel to provide enough heat to break apart the rest of the fuel molecules into a hydrogen-rich gas. Or a, a combination that's been developed much more recently called autothermal reformation, where you can adjust the enthalpy of the reaction by adjusting the amount of air that you put into the process. In the limits, zero air steam reforming. Um, enough air to provide all the energy for the process, partial oxidation. But you have the ability to adjust this to go to different levels of endothermicity, to go from a thermoneutral point all the way to very endothermic. Each of these types of processes has particular um, limitations and strengths. And the partial oxidation process has a relatively low overall thermal efficiency because you are combusting a significant portion of your fuel that you're trying to convert. So you, you take a loss right off the top, and then it also has fairly high catalyst temperatures. So it's more difficult to utilize um, any waste heat in the process. It's more difficult to get heat that's at that temperature that it can be exchanged directly into this process. Steam reformation is a little bit slow response time, has the potential to, to use waste heat, but since there's no other way of generating heat internally, 
all the heat has to be supplied externally. So that means either all the heat has to be supplied by pretty high temperature exhaust gases, or you have to burn some fuel in a burner and, and suffer some heat transfer losses as you try to get that combustion heat into the device. Finally, autothermal reformation is very interesting. It combines some of the, the good properties of both systems. And by adjusting the amount of air, you can um, utilize different waste heat temperatures. So I'll focus on autothermal reformation. My work has made a, a novel application of autothermal reformation to thermochemical recuperation in order to increase the levels of waste heat that you can utilize in order to push that boundary to be able to utilize lower temperatures if necessary. So in this process, you need some low temperature heat for the preheating of the fuel and water mixture and, and vaporization of this water mixture. So this heat can come between you know, ambient temperature and around 100 degrees C. With a coolant loop running at around 100 degrees C, you can provide much of this heat from the coolant loop, where you're actually providing a cooling service to the engine. You're, this coolant loop is trying to reject heat, so you can actually replace part of the um, radiator with this heat exchanger and, and take away some of the heat, excess heat from the engine in this vaporization process. You can then um, continue to superheat that vapor using exhaust gas heat. And depending on the reformer that you choose and the catalyst temperatures that are required and your, waste, and your waste heat temperatures, you can do heat exchange between the exhaust gases and the catalytic reactor as well. And if you use autothermal reformation, you can inject air so that if your waste heat is insufficient to reach the catalyst temperatures that you require for the process, you can preheat to the level that's possible and then just add enough air to reach temperatures that are high enough for your process to happen. And that way, even if your exhaust gases are fairly low temperature, you aren't burning very valuable high exergy fuel to provide low exergy heat for vaporization and preheating. If you do this, you have the potential to get rid of that second heat exchanger simplifying the system. And there's an interesting possibility of instead directly mixing some hot exhaust gases into the catalytic process. And this would accomplish two things, that it will, these hot exhaust gases will directly carry sensible enthalpy into the system, thermal energy into the system, and it also carries in water vapor, that there's a significant portion of water vapor in the exhaust. So you may be able to reduce or potentially displace the required water for the process. But you have significant dilution, primarily nitrogen, some CO2, and trace species by doing this. And there's standing questions about how this would affect the balance of the network of reactions that happen in the process, how this would affect the efficiency of the process, and the hydrogen yield that you can extract. In trying to understand the efficiency of this process, I realized that the analogy with a heat pump is pretty good that you can define a, a coefficient of chemical performance, or sorry, chemical of coefficient performance um, as the lower heating value of your hydrogen-rich gas that's coming out of the process divided by the sum of the lower heating value that, of the fuel that you put into the process plus any, um, any heat required, any fuel required to combust to do any external heating from the process. So any preheating, vaporization, or superheating that you need to do combustion externally for, you, you have a, a heat demand, and you have to divide that by the heat transfer efficiency to get that heat into the process, which can be a significant loss, especially in small-scale devices. Um, if you recover heat, you s directly subtract that heat demand from the each subsequent process, whether it be preheat, vaporization, superheat, or the chemical um, reaction itself. 
in theory, with complete reactions, no side products, complete selectivity, um, three typical reactions that happen in reformation processes produce different um, hydrogen-rich gas compositions and I have different enthalpies of reaction resulting in different um, chemical coefficients of performance. And ideally, by making a syngas with carbon monoxide and hydrogen, you can achieve a, one point, a CCOP of 1.2. That means if you put in one kilojoule of ethanol, lower heating value fuel, you can get out, theoretically, 1.2 kilojoules of hydrogen-rich gas, lower heating value. And in addition to this gain, if you use it in hydrogen enrichment in the engine, you also um, have the benefits of increased efficiency in that conversion process. Now, trying to take a step back from that perfect ideal and say, okay, with different exhaust temperatures and, and a couple different required catalyst temperatures and some assumptions about um, temperature approach for your heat exchangers and still assuming um, complete reactions and no side products, how close, oh, sorry about the graphic there, how close can you get to that ideal? And, and you find that if you're trying to maximize the hydrogen production, um, so you're mixing in um, as much water as you can to try to drive the water gas shift reaction to convert CO to CO2 and release more hydrogen, you can achieve these coefficients of chemical performance. Um, and with exhaust gases above you know, 500 degrees C, you start to see um, some net gains in chemical efficiency. So this is interesting, but so far we've assumed complete reactions and no side products. To start to chip away at some of these assumptions, we can do, make an equilibrium model where you get constant pressure, the pressure drop over this system is very small, so that's a pretty good um, assessment. Adiabatic, the real reactors will have some heat loss, so that's not a perfect assumption, but with appropriate insulation, you can start to approach it. And assuming a given inlet temperature and dilution with 85% nitrogen and 15% CO2, you can perform a Gibbs free energy minimization amongst the species in order to get your equilibrium compositions. Doing this gives you a hydrogen yield at low temperature inlets, 200 degrees C inlets. So exhaust gases, you know, 250, 300 degrees C to transfer heat to preheat your stream to 200 degrees C at the inlet, you see that as you mix in dilutant gases from no dilution to 20 moles of that nitrogen CO2 mixture per mole of ethanol processed, you get a sharp decline in the hydrogen yield. And you would expect that because the gases that you're putting in are well below the catalyst temperature. So you're, you're diluting with something that's adding heat capacity that's below the catalytic temperature. So more of the energy has to go into heating up all of those gases to get to the catalyst temperature before you even start to do the reaction. And you see that adding more air helps you. It starts, starts providing that heat internally from, from combusting a fraction of that fuel on the catalyst so that the increase in the carbon ratio continues to give you better hydrogen yield. As we increase the inlet temperature, increase the, the um, waste heat quality, um, we see that the, this picture starts to change. Instead of this precipitous drop-off, this drop-off starts to get more shallow. And instead of a continuing increase in hydrogen yield with increasing oxygen carbon ratio, you see a maxima. And as we go to, to higher temperatures, 800 degrees C, you see that that required oxygen carbon ratio for maximum hydrogen yield is, is progressing towards zero. And so the, the hotter the gases are that you put in, the more sensible enthalpy between the inlet temperature and the catalyst temperature is available to drive the reaction and less oxygen is needed to combust fuel in order to provide that last bit of heat to the process. A similar trend happens for the coefficient of chemical performance. 
Um, you start out low temperatures with a very big drop off with increase, increased dilution. Then you start to flatten out. And then as you get to hot, high inlet temperatures, you actually see a reversal of the trend that adding more exhaust gases can actually produce a, a higher chemical coefficient of performance if your exhaust gases are hot enough. And this 800 degrees C is not unreasonable for direct mixing the exhaust gases. Gives you a small temperature drop from the, from the engine outlet, but is still pretty high. But it shows that it's, it's interesting. The process can utilize waste heat of the quality that or is expected to be able to utilize the waste heat of the quality that's available from the engine exhaust gases. Of course, in a real system, you don't achieve equilibrium necessarily. Some cases you might, other cases you'll have limiting mechanisms, rate mechanisms that prevent you from achieving um, that equilibrium. And these include chemical reaction kinetics, mass transport rates, and in, in the case of autothermal reformation, the heat generation from the oxidation reactions and the rate of heat transfer either from the higher temperature gases to the catalyst or away from the catalyst to the lower temperature gases. You can start to analyze these different rates by um, developing a characteristic time model. It's probably the simplest, simplest approach. And by assuming a first order rate limitation, you can um, develop a characteristic time for ethanol conversion. And then you can, using intrinsic rate data for these different processes, compare these rates. Um, I won't get too into the details of the analysis, but in the talk, to try to save some time, but if you want to talk about this afterwards, I'd be happy to go over it with you in detail. So finally, getting past the modeling and saying, well, can this really work? Can we really do this? Um, can we really get more uh, lower heating value out than we put in? Um, we, we decided to take an experimental approach. And this is just a picture of the system where we have our water and alcohol source. We've got a vaporizer train, a superheater to reach our intended inlet temperatures, and then the reactor. And then after the reactor, we go through a condenser where we drop out any unconverted water, un unconverted ethanol, and we go to a gas analyzer um, with an NDIR and, and TCD sensors to, to try to quantify the hydrogen, CO, and CO2, and CH4 produced by the process. The, the catalyst looks something like this. It's a wash-coated honeycomb monolith catalyst. It's very similar in structure to the catalyst in the catalytic converter. The metals on it are platinum group metals, some um, rhodium, but pretty similar, slightly different composition than the catalyst that's already in your catalytic converter. So we're not talking about two exotic um, catalysts that are going to cost a fortune to, to put together that the, the cost could approach catalytic converter costs. So what did we find? After a lot of non-trivial work um, trying to develop accurate measurements and troubleshooting the system, we, we were able to determine that there's, there are distinctly different operating regimes for this system um, depending on the inlet temperature. For high inlet temperatures, increasing the dilution as we expected from the equilibrium models, increases the coefficient of chemical performance and increases the hydrogen yield. And for the low inlet temperature, increasing dilution um, decreases the, the coefficient of chemical performance and decreases the hydrogen yield. A simple um, chart of the chemical coefficient of performance for the process um, over the uh, design of experiment factorial runs for oxygen to carbon ratio, inlet temperature, and dilution in moles per mole of ethanol um, shows, that, shows that same statement. So at the high temperatures, we can get the maximum um, CCOP of over, over unity um, for the 600 degree C inlet case 
with a low oxygen to carbon ratio. And by when we have low exhaust temperatures, we can choose not to use dilution and to use a, a low oxygen to carbon ratio to still achieve a respectable over 80% thermal efficiency for the process. So a CCOP of over 0.8. So even with low temperature exhaust gases that could, could be provided by you know, newer, very efficient engine cycles like homogeneous charge compression ignition cycles, we could still get some useful energy recovered to make the hydrogen production process more efficient. This shows us that the potential for ethanol thermochemical recuperation is very significant, that um, we can achieve high efficiencies at low temperatures and slightly above um, total coefficients of chemical performance at high temperatures, but there are some drawbacks. And significant, if using the catalyst that, that we had available to us, we produced a significant amount of methane in the process. And it's not totally clear how this methane is going to affect the hydrogen enrichment um, benefits for the engine. So that's an, an, an area of, of future research that definitely needs to be addressed. And I have a number of ideas to increase the selectivity towards hydrogen for this process through reactor design, catalyst choice, and particularly even system design, reducing residence time in the heated sections after the oxygen's been um, injected to reduce homogeneous reactions that generate some of the unwanted side products. Some of the potential benefits of this process that for the fraction of fuel that we process, we can get up to a 10% um, total um, chemical energy gain in, in an optimized system. Um, this, this is significant, but if we're only processing a small fraction of the fuel, it's not a huge game changer. It could still be significant, even if you're only using 20, even if you're only converting 20% of your fuel, that could still lead to an overall 2% increase in efficiency for the integrated engine TCR system, which is significant, not easy to achieve. But as you go to higher fractions of ethanol being processed, you, that could, could increase. Um, and you also have the potential to get the engine hydrogen enrichment benefits that in the literature, there's reports of energy efficiency improvements everywhere from minus 10% for some experiments that didn't account for the changes in the combustion process for the spark timing settings for the engine, all the way to reports of up to plus 50% for the energy efficiency for different engines and different fuels. A more reasonable estimate is kind of the high end of around 30%. Um, and engine efficiency improvements. And I'd be happy to talk much more in depth about how hydrogen enrichment achieves these efficiency improvements if you're interested. So we also see not only this, you know, cost savings, fuel saving, energy efficiency improvements, but also, as we saw, significant reductions in emissions. NOx reductions of more than 95% are achievable, and unburned hydrocarbons can be reduced by up to 90%. And there's exciting opportunities to combine both the private good of saved fuel costs as well as the public good of reduced emissions, and to allow some different engines that run on waste fuels such as landfill gas to be sited in areas that the uh, the regulations current restri currently restrict their use. Overall, societal impacts are kind of obvious from those significant energy efficiency and emissions reductions, but reduced fuel use, saved money, um, changes in, in fuel costs and distribution, reduced criteria pollutant emissions affecting human health and agricultural productivity, and reduced greenhouse gas emissions with a global impact. 
So an overview, thermal chemical recuperation for hydrogen enrichment can be applied in the near term. We're not dependent on giant infrastructures, infrastructures for central hydrogen production, delivery, and distribution. Um, and there's opportunities overall, not just in this process, but for this process to be coupled with many different types of waste heat um, sources. And so we see opportunities to increase efficiency both by hydrogen enrichment of internal combustions and potentially other combustion processes, um, opportunities to increase efficiency through utilization of waste heat, and finally opportunities to increase efficiency by more fully utilizing the exergy of our primary energy resources. And that's, that's one that I want everyone to kind of mull over and think about because I think it's an often neglected source for transformational change in our energy systems. In my future work, I hope to continue exploring this potential for transformational change by starting out with just evaluations of different waste heat resources across our economy um, and identifying other potential applications for hydrogen enrichment that could utilize these waste heat resources and by making advancements in the thermochemical um, recuperation reactor design to reduce methane production, to increase the heat transfer efficiencies, um, and to allow more successful thermal integration between thermochemical recuperation and waste heat sources. I'd like to thank my laboratory um, under Professor Paul Erickson at UC Davis, the Hydrogen Production Utilization Laboratory, for giving me a home to, to really initiate this area of research. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Department of Energy Graduate Automotive Technology Education grants for supporting myself um, and the ITS Sustainable Transportation Center for a dissertation year fellowship to supporting this work. And I'd like to open the floor to any questions that you have. And I got, I think that's the first one I saw up there. Okay, uh, I realize you have a lab set up as opposed to, say, production. Uh, two questions. Where do you see the first application of, of some of your work? And second, uh, if you look at an automobile, how much additional stuff and weight would you be putting in an automobile to do this? That's, those are excellent questions. And the second question really contributes to the first question. The first places I see this being utilized is in stationary systems, where you, you have a lot of room for demonstration project type applications, where you have not fully, you know, successfully shrunk all the components and cost reduced all the components. So I see the first stages being in stationary generators, in agricultural water pumps. Um, an exciting potential would be for hydrogen enrichment um, in very large natural gas um, engines that run compressors for all the natural gas pipelines across the country, which actually use a, a very large amount of energy to move this gas that a lot of people are kind of unaware of. Another application could potentially be in providing hydrogen for landfill gas utilization that, as I mentioned, in in any area that's a non-attainment area for NOx emissions under the EPA regulations, there are very strict standards for citing new sources of nitrogen oxides. And so there's significant amounts of landfill gas that are stranded in these regions that have to be flared instead of run through an engine to generate electricity or other useful work. And it's, it's a shame to be wasting these fuel resources um, and hydrogen enrichment may be one of the keys to reducing those emissions and enabling use of those resources. Then to kind of address the second question, uh, it's, it's a little early for me to say too much about exactly how big the system is, but I'm, my current application uses a catalyst that's about three quarters of an inch in diameter and an inch and a half long. And because of my actually pumping and pressure drop limitations in the tubes in the rest of our system, I, I have not been able to push that catalyst to its maximum gas hourly flow rate. But even with those limitations, I can process a two to three kilowatt flow of ethanol. And so if you're talking about a 20% um, replacement of ethanol energy in say, uh, 
a 100 kilowatt engine, you, you don't have to multiply that small catalyst size too many times to get to a system that could provide enough hydrogen at the very least to see substantial emissions reductions and probably get getting approaching the points where you see substantial efficiency improvements in a system that the catalytic part of the system would be similar in size to your catalytic converter now. Um, as far as the, the heat exchange parts of the system architecture, I think it, it very much depends on your strategy. If you, can, if you can take in a large portion of the waste heat required by direct exhaust gas missing, the system could be relatively compact. If you have low waste heat temperatures, then you'll need larger heat exchangers. So there's, there's definitely some, some operating boundaries on what the system could look at like, and that's one of the next sections of my work, is to try to understand that space. And I, I think I saw you next. Yeah, I was, this is not my field, so I was curious what kind of experiments you do and how you gather the data and then how you compare that data with your theory. That's a very good question. I mean, I could try to, try to come back here to just with a system schematic that in this system everything's heated with electric heaters that are computer controlled. We we use some um, phase modulators to um, proportionally control the amount of power going to each heater to achieve different set points. We've got a large number of thermocouples measuring surface temperatures on the heaters, gas temperatures um, throughout the system and then within the catalyst um, have four thermocouples that enter into the catalyst from below are depicted here to try to measure the catalyst temperatures, try to understand what's happening in the process. Um, in order to measure the conversion of ethanol, we take the condensate, the condensed water and ethanol, and we, we measure the density of this, of this um, condensate in order to calculate the slip ethanol and water, and there's some there's some error in that because there are potentially other side products that could be condensable. They're typically small fractions, so they shouldn't affect the density a lot, but they do affect the density some. Um, in my future work, I would love to collaborate to use some HPLC or GC mass spec to. Um, try to identify exactly the compounds there to make sure that all of them would be successfully combusted in the engine and wouldn't cause any unintentional emissions downstream. Um, we use a gas analyzer, as I mentioned, with a non-dispersive infrared sensor um, and coupled with a thermal conductivity detector to differentiate between hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and CO2 and methane. There's also some error involved in this methane assumption because it, it assumes that all hydrocarbon gas species are methane and that's not always true. So there's some error associated with that measurement. Once again, uh, GC mass spec or other um, fairly expensive but attainable equipment could help us speciate these gaseous um, compounds to make sure that we're not making anything that could cause problems downstream. Uh -huh. And determining the energy, mm -hmm. do that by measuring temperature and calculating? So the chemical coefficient of performance is purely the chemical energy going in. So we know the change in weight of the water and ethanol mixture, and we have very carefully um, calculated the, the um, fraction the weight mass fraction of that, that is ethanol. So we know by the change in weight for the inlet carboy, the total amount of ethanol that's gone into the system. Um, so we know the chemical energy in, the lower heating value in, from knowing the amount of ethanol that goes in. Then we find out, okay, how much of these gases comes out, and we know the lower heating value of each of these gases, and by integrating this signal over the entire run and using the assumption that <laughs> that's that's my girlfriend in West Africa so <laughs> that's that's a little unexpected <laughs> um, so by by integrating that the 
the, the mole fractions here and multiplying um, and basically if you if you sum up all of these mole fractions they don't add up to a hundred percent because there's also nitrogen dilution that's coming in either with the air and with your um, dilutant purposeful dilutant gases and that that nitrogen is not measured so we, we use mass flow controllers to control the amount of air that's put in and the, the amount of nitrogen that's put in. And by summing up the amount of the number of moles of nitrogen that we put in and knowing that it's the only gas that's, that's significant that's not detected here, we can assume that the balance of the gas, so if this adds up to 80%, then that 20% left over is the total amount of nitrogen that's coming through the system and you know so so if that's 20 percent if you multiply by five you get um, the times the integrated um, mole fractions here you get the total amount of hydrogen that came out the total moles of hydrogen total moles of CO total moles of CH4 you know the lower heating values of each of these and you sum them up to get your total chemical energy coming out. So you don't, you're not relying on the thermal energy at all. That if it's, since you're solely looking at the chemical coefficient of performance, there's, it's, it's, it's a little easier to, to nail everything down, but there are errors both in assuming that everything in here that's not water is ethanol. We think that's relatively small, but we, I haven't checked at, at every operating point um, and by assuming that all of the measured hydrocarbon here is methane, that could also be a source of error in those measurements. Well, on maturation of this kind of technology for uh, implementation of like this large scale for combustion engine, would, you, would it be necessary to do a different kind of combustion engine compared to like with ACCI engine? Um, it looks like hydrogen enrichment is typically compatible with current combustion engines. So there's, there's even the chance to potentially retrofit existing vehicles with this technology, although to get the, the maximum um, energy efficiency gain, you would, if, you, if you run ultra-dilute or, or ultra-lean using the hydrogen enrichment, this mixture has um, is, is more tolerant to, to higher, higher compression. So you can increase the compression ratio of the engine and, and ratchet up the efficiency benefit that you can get. So future engines that actually have more adjustable compression ratios, such as the, the Atkin cycle engine in the Priuses can, over a narrow band, adjust the compression ratio. Future engines with continuously adjustable valve timing would potentially be able to take more advantage of the hydrogen enrichment than, than you know, if you were trying to retrofit a current vehicle. Um, things like HCCI could potentially be compatible with hydrogen enrichment. Um, hydrogen enrichment actually increases the um, operating zone of the, the engine map where HCCI operation is controllable. Um, so there's a number of groups that have investigated that process. So that could be one technique for actually making that very high efficiency um, engine operating regime available over a wider range. Um, but that's a, a kind of early area of research and it's hard to say whether if that's going to be the, the most likely way to implement HCCI. You talked about uh, reduction of NOx as one of the primary benefits, and you also talked about um, dilution with direct injection of uh, exhaust gases that are heavy in nitrogen. And the question is, which way does that go? Do you burn off more of the NOx by injecting back in, or do you generate more NOx by injecting back in lots of nitrogen? So if you, if you put in exhaust gases, you, the exhaust gases have a uh, higher average um, cease of P, so you actually get a, f um, a faster temp average temperature or maximum temperature decline. So you actually get faster NOx reduction from high EGR strategies, whereas if you put in higher, higher um, air strategies, you don't get 
as big of reductions in the NOx until you start running very lean and very high percentages of fuel replacement with hydrogen. So um, the, for converting fractions of the fuel, you're likely to go with an EGR strategy for NOx emissions reduction as opposed to a lean strategy. If you're going to be um, trying to convert a large fraction of the fuel, you might start to go to a lean strategy where you, in the limit here, you start to see some benefits from the change in the uh, ratio of specific heats um, for the polytropic expansion work from the lean strategy actually getting you a little bit more efficient than the, uh, than the exhaust gas recirculation strategy. When you have this connected to an engine, I think that we both would agree that the energy you put in in the fuel and the air that you burn will equal the energy you get out as a work for the engine plus the energy out of the waste product. Yes. So, but the device you're talking about doesn't have the engine connected to it yet. Yes. So I'm having a little trouble understanding the COP because the COP to me means the work out of the It's. So, so I, mm -hmm. what I'm really getting to is in the device you have, the energy flow out of it must equal the energy flow into it. Mm -hmm. And so what exactly are you calculating this COP from? I don't care about the measurement. So yeah. The no, that's, that's a good question. Let me see. Where is that guy? There it is. Or no, that's a character scale. So in defining the, the CCOP, the, the COP for a heat pump is the heat energy moved divided by the electrical energy put in. Yeah. And so here, the, the chemical coefficient of performance is simply the, the chemical energy coming out of the device, because the purpose, the, the desire that we measure that by combusting. You could measure it by combusting it. So in these experiments, I've measured it by um, multiplying the number of moles of the different products by their lower heating value. Let's just back up a second. Mm -hmm. the material is this ethanol plus air. And you could measure the energy in that by burning it in a combustion bomb and measuring it in the usual way. Right? Yeah, and that's how you would calculate the lower heating value. Coming out of it in terms of the exhaust gases, Anything else coming out? So, so the, the reformate gases, the hydrogen rich gases coming out, then the lower heating value at the you outlet. Burn those as well. You, you could burn those, yes. Because, because that's not the only thing going on in the system. The reason why you can achieve an over unity CCOP is because you're not counting the value of any waste heat that's utilized in the process. You're, right. you're give Back up a second. Mm -hmm. I just have this thing in which I'm putting ethanol and air into it, and I'm taking out whatever is produced. Yeah. Which is the energy that I'm putting out. You're putting ethanol in steam, and it, if you need to, a tiny fraction of air to, so, and you're, you're transferring heat into this process. I have, do I have an external source of heat as well? You, you just have the fuel and the oxidizer. So when you, when you put in the fuel and the steam and the dilutant gases, which so you've got a significant um, CP, you've got a significant heat capacity because you've got 20 times the number of moles of dilutant gases than the number of moles of, of fuel. And if you, if you put in these gases at a temperature above the temperature, the outlet temperature, above the, the required catalyst temperature, then the difference in sensible enthalpy between the inlet temperature and the outlet temperature from the catalyst is available to drive that chemical reaction. Don't look inside the thing. Just take the inputs and the outputs. Are they equal in energy content? No. If, well, well <laughs> because, because we're only taking chemical energy here. The, the, oh, the total energy is the same. Yeah, the total, the total energy is the same. It's, it's very, uh, you, you get practically some heat energy lost because it's not perfectly insulated, but 
you, you, this is the chemical coefficient of performance. So if I if I gave you just the thermal efficiency of the device, it's it's less. It, well, it's if it was totally adiabatic, it would be it would be the, the same total energy is going in as coming out. But some of that energy that went in as heat is coming out as chemical energy. And how do I get the chemical energy by converting it? I burn it in a, a you, you, you put it in, yeah. I burn it, and I see how much heat I got out of it. Exactly. I think he's counting the heat that he puts in free, so to speak, because he's supposing that it's going to be derived from the waste heat after the process. Is that right? Mm -hmm. okay. So, so just so just like the heat pump, in the heat pump, you you don't divide the heat going into your house by the amount of electricity you put in plus the amount of energy that you extracted from the outdoors and pumped into your house. You only divide it by because you assume that that energy from the outdoors is free. That's the, the only difference is that in this case you're putting in chemical energy instead of instead of electricity. And you're simply not counting the heat you put in as well as the chemical. E exactly. This is only the chemical balance. The, this is the chemical only energy balance. And so if I put in a term in the top here, lower heat, lower heating value outlet plus the thermal energy of the outlet gases, and then on the bottom added a term for the thermal energy of the inlet gases, then even if, if all the heat was supplied by waste heat, you, you could never go over a value of one. You could never, you know, you'd never would, you don't have any other energy coming into the system. You would only have heat losses from, the, from a practical system. I think, uh, if I see the diagram of chemicals going in and Okay, that that's I I don't I don't show that diagram. I have some charts here if you want to come down and, and look at them afterwards. But I think that would be a good addition to the talk. Always like this with the energy balance. <laughs> yes, yes, I I know that's that that makes everybody really nervous, and that's. That was one of the motivations when I first started talking about this. I, I would kind of cringe and say, "Oh, and the, the, the chemical efficiency can be over one." And kind of go, "No, everybody gets really skeptical." And so, but I, I feel like defining this coefficient of performance is reasonable. I think the analogy with the heat pump is is actually a, a reasonably good one. When you get the energy, when you get the engine put on there, yeah, we can talk about efficiency. I, I'm very curious to, to see that closed loop efficiency, and it's a little ways down the road. But I wanted to ask you about uh, chemical mass balance. You talked about yeah. You, you showed um, some calculations, equilibrium calculations. You showed hydrogen yields, fairly impressive hydrogen yields, uh, at fairly high O2 to C ratio. But I'd like to know more about where the is. So in your equilibrium calculation, you're certainly going to get a sweet product. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about what that distribution looks like, what you assume going in for calculating. Okay. Um, the, the assumed products can, can include a number of intermediate and side products. Um, in, in these equilibrium calculations, I have limited that somewhat to, to, to for, for the ones that I showed right here, I limited that just to carbon monoxide, CO2, and methane. So you didn't look at any of the That's, so why not? To be totally honest, that was something that I wanted to do and had planned to do the day that I found out that my mom has brain cancer and flew to Madison, Wisconsin for the brain surgery. So I guess that's that's my one <laughs> one trump card. I, I'm, I'm using an Aspen Plus um, simulation, assuming an adiabatic reactor, um, defining inlet temperatures using the nonlinear two, two liquid method for estimating um, um, chemical uh, activities and then performing the Gibbs free energy minimization. Basically, all I have to do is go in and, and input a number of other species. I've identified the like the next seven to ten species. Oh, I'm sorry. In the equilibrium calculation, I also included solid carbon. 
so for, for coke formation. So that's, that's in there. Um, some other products include acetaldehyde, acetic acid, um, ethane, ethane, ethene, um, and, and there's a, a couple more that I can't remember off the top of my head that, that I've identified that should go into that model. It should be pretty trivial to, to put them in, but they're not in the results that you saw. I think we have time for one more question. I've seen a commercially available gadget for cars that uh, uses electrolysis with electricity from the alternator to split uh, water. Yes. Yes. Does that, are you familiar with it? Does it work? I, I, I'm pretty sure the answer is no. Because, um, and this is actually one of the things that started me down this pathway is that I, I learned about hydrogen enrichment and I was talking to people and I heard about these kind of commercial devices and I found a bunch of websites and I talked to a couple companies and they all had outrageous things to say about doubling your fuel economy and slashing your emissions to 1% of what they usually are and all these, all these different things. And we actually got a company to come down um, and show us some of their units and we, we took a couple of vehicles with the units installed and the quickest thing to do was to take them over to a smog check station with a chassis dynamometer and, and see if there was any change in at least the emissions with, with the devices turned on and turned off. And we couldn't find any statistical change. They swore that something was wrong and they were going to fix the systems. They, they drove back to Oregon and they came back down two months later and we did it again with the same result. So I'm, I'm quite skeptical of those systems and from just a simple off the top of the head energy balance perspective, if you're starting with one unit of fuel energy and you put it through an internal combustion engine, optimistically over the drive cycle maybe 20% efficient. And so you're down to 0.2 units of mechanical energy. You use that mechanical energy to drive an alternator. Alternators, standard alternators kind of max out their sweet spots around 60% efficient. So now, now you're down to 12% to efficiency. Then you put it through an electrolyzer. A well-designed electrolyzer might be in the 70% efficiency range, but those are thousands of dollars for, and, and tens of thousands of dollars to achieve a significant flow rate. Um, the units that are being sold are more likely, you know, very kindly 50% efficient. So you're talking about a 6% energy efficiency going from primary fuel to hydrogen production. Um, I'm really doubtful that the small amounts of hydrogen that you could practically make with those devices can, can get you much energy efficiency change. They might affect the emissions a little bit with an appropriate designed device, um, but I'm really skeptical that they can get much energy efficiency benefits at all. And I'm very skeptical that those efficiency benefits could actually offset this, this 6% this 94% loss in energy through that, through those conversion steps. That's very true. That's, and that's when you add hydrogen to the combustion process, that's one of the main mechanisms for this energy conversion. But if you've taken all of this energy to generate the hydrogen, even if you do help a that fuel burn more completely, even if that there's, you, you have to have a very large net gain in efficiency to offset that all that energy used to make the hydrogen. And that's actually one of the things that got me started down this pathway is saying, okay, instead of going through chemical to thermal to mechanical to electrical back to chemical, why not just go chemical to chemical? Why not take the fuel and reform it so now we've got one step and it's staying chemical energy, we're just changing the form. And then it's an endothermic process. So if we can take advantage of waste heat, even low level waste heat for vaporization, we can make this robustly efficient. And so I feel like there, there's, a lot, there's a lot better opportunities with the reformation chemical pathway than there is for the electrolysis pathway. I won't tell you that I, I'm 100% absolutely sure it never works in any situation, but I'm very skeptical. So on the punchline of robust efficiency, let's thank our speaker.